It's a time to recuperate. It's a time to inspire and transform. It's a time to fill our hearts with love and hope in this sacred place. Paul's going to sing Summertime. Is that a threat? Yeah, it's a, it, it's a threat, Paul. I'm going to help him. And uh, the first thing that went wrong this morning is Paul would like you to sing. <laughs> you can just hum along if you like. It is still summertime, so we should take advantage of that. service coordinator from the Sunday service committee and I'm going to be running this three ring circus this morning. If you could put your hands together just for a second like this and say oh please make this work. Thank you. Uh, joys and concerns. Good morning, everybody. It is a joy to see you all. I'm Leslie Gibbons. I'm another SC. And also, I am the J and C coordinator. That's joys and concerns. So if you have any, call me. Yeah. Um, I'm very pleased to say that we're going to continue the tradition of doing uh, joys and concerns from the chancel every Sunday. And I want to point out to you that we have now at the back in the lobby, we have a book for you to put in any announcements that you would like to have made uh, each Sunday. I urge you to make sure that you have permission to write somebody's name down or they'll have a big shock on Sunday. But we would be most grateful if you could put something 
in there if you, and a, a celebration, a birth, whatever is in your heart. Now, it is my sad task to start out this Sunday with, with terrible news. And that is, our Janelle Hilton has lost her daughter. Her daughter passed away in Guatemala, and uh, this is a terrible shock for everyone. Um, her name was Maureen, and I know Janelle is here this morning and would welcome our full community mm -hmm. hug when you see her after the service. I'm so glad she's here. This is, this is one reason why we all come together, isn't it? So that we can support each other when there are times like this and celebrate each other or when we see the other side of the spectrum. Thank you. Liz, do you want to come up and light the candle here? Should we stand? Liz is doing two different things this morning, or three or four different things. We're going to light the candles together because this year we're going to be together. We want to grab a taper. And you too, Liz. And let's light them. Try to set the church on. <clears throat> anyway, Barry. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Barry Forbes, and Carrie asked me to welcome you today and say a few words about this community as your board P, P for president. We are using shortened versions today, right? <laughs> this is the start of a new year, and in some ways the start of a new chapter for the North Shore Unitarian Church. But our mission remains the same. We strive to live with depth, meaning, and purpose by creating a place for all of us who wish to belong with heart, thrive in spirit, and act in the service of life. It was my pleasure, along with Liz Moffat this morning, to welcome each and every one of you with a hug. And you're going to see this on a regular basis. Board members are going to be the greeters from now on to help us welcome people in with grace and enthusiasm. But I think it's important for everybody to know who's on the board. So I'll ask the members to stand as I read out their names and stay standing until everybody's up. But first I'll mention that our Vice President, Rebecca Lindley, is working on Salt Spring Island this weekend. She's, uh, she's teaching doctors how to be good doctors. And so she's not able to be with us, but she's the first one that I'm, I'm gonna list off. Uh, Brian Funt is our treasurer. Brian, stay standing, there's Brian. <laughs> Secretary is Leslie Gibbons over here. And we have five members at large on the board. There's Elaine Duval, which is here someplace. There's Elaine, right there. Um, Marga Hanna, she's also here, there, right beside. Barb Kroon, where are you, Barb? There you are. And Liz Moffat. And way in the back, where are you, Brian Wellwood? He's, there he is, way back there. So I'd like you to thank these people for their dedication so far. <laughs> All these people have had leadership positions over the years. They've gained much wisdom and experience both here and in their personal lives, private lives. The group has had many, this group, our group, has had many meetings and conversations throughout the summer to prepare for this coming year. 
We work very well together and we're excited about our future. Rebecca, who also chairs the Sunday Services team, or the SST, is it? SST, asked me to say a few words about our plans to be lay led this year. She and her team, many of, all of, most of whom are there, um, have, have created an overarching plan for the entire year. They will deliver services that will connect to our principles and our sources, that will vary in content, structure, and focus. Some services will have an outside speaker, and some will have a talkback session after, each of the, each, after the service. Some will be very like our traditional services, and some will be more experimental in nature. We hope you find them engaging, thoughtful, and believe me, they will be offered from the heart. And please know that the team will be looking for your feedback all along the way. Now, I've always had trouble when somebody asked me what it means to be a Unitarian. And our experiences this past year, tough as they were, helped me hone my thoughts on what we mean by our traditional values of freedom, reason, and tolerance. For me, they mean having freedom of thought and speech. As long as I expect, express myself respectfully, of course, they mean having to support my ideas with reason. And they mean working for the greater good with people I may disagree with. Being a Unitarian means as much as possible that I live these values and I also affirm and promote the eight principles that underlie our faith. Principles that guide our efforts as we strive to create more justice and love in our own lives and in the world. Despite there being different interpretations about how we go about living our values and principles, rest assured that we, as a congregation, are not broken. Those were the very words that the Reverend Ann Barker said to us as she interviewed our board about our transition, moving from a minister, a minister, a congregation that's led by a minister to being lay led. Now, Ann is a um, ordained Unitarian minister and she's the new Western Region Congregational Life Coordinator for the CUC. She is our point person with the CUC. She's very kind and competent. And we had an interview with her. Some members of the board had an interview with her. And in the middle of the interview, she stopped us. And she asked us all to gather around the Zoom camera that we were working on. And she said those very words, you are not broken. We are a strong community. Her encouragement and affirmation of our approach inspired us all. She gave us confidence that we're on the right track as we work to strengthen bonds and trust within our spiritual community, as we strive to be stronger together. Now, speaking of being stronger together, I'll tell you a quick story about a transformation that resulted from my being part of this community. In what I sometimes call my dark ages, over 100 years ago, in an NSUC adult education program, I expressed my opinion, my opposition, to gay couples being allowed to adopt children. I felt that adopted kids had already enough strikes against them in society, that being adopted by a gay couple was just too much to, be, to expect of a child. But in this very church, that idea was challenged. It took me some time to change my mind, but the penultimate moment came when Sue and I went to the Elliott camp that's held every summer. And there we got to know a gay couple who had adopted two children. They were the best parents I'd ever seen, and that changed my mind. And I really thank you, the members of this community, for opening my eyes, especially as years later, our own daughter came out and eventually she and her wife investigated the opportunity to adopt a child. I was so glad that they consider that option, they could consider that option 
and that Sue and I would support them had that been their choice. So here we are at the threshold of what some would consider a new beginning for the North Shore Unitarian Church. This year is pivotal, and all I can ask is that everyone pitch in. Listen to each other, challenge and learn from each other, and if need be, agree to disagree while remaining friends and fellow congregants. Let's show how we can truly live our values of freedom, reason, and tolerance. Let's live up to the belief that we do not think alike to live alike, to love alike. We will be stronger together as we create more justice and love in our own lives and in the world. As Anne said, we are not broken. Thank you. Beautiful words, beautiful words. If the church doesn't transform you, what's the point? If it doesn't touch your heart, your head, your essence, your soul, if you are so inclined, what's the point? To inspire you to live with deeper meaning, deeper ideas, and we aim for this today, connection and reconnection. We have a collective identity, attitudes, values honed over the 56 years that this church has existed, held by the principles. I had to leave in the last few years, as many did, and many came back. I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to see you here. I'm happy to feel that community. Let the words of 13th century Persian poet and mystic Sufi Rumi wash over you and speak for me. Come, come, whoever you are, wanderer, worshiper, lover of leaving. Ours is no caravan of despair. Come, yet again come, even if you've left a thousand times. We were stronger together back then too. Without a minister, it's us, it's we, it's me, and it's you. We must be together. The Sunday Service Committee has taken on the role of the minister. It's going to be a huge undertaking, and we hope that you support us. It's Dennis Cooper, Allison. Dennis is doing the burgers downstairs. It's Leslie Gibbons. Rebecca Lindley, not here today, Bruce, Sue Forbes, and myself. We're each going to take half a dozen services, and they're going to be experiments. There's going to be a wonderful variety. You are going to see clearly how we do. Might be the best thing ever. We are stronger together. Now, it's time for the opening hymn. If you'd stand up, we're going to have uh, our first opportunity at transformation. This church doesn't usually move. <laughs> we want you to sing out. Liz, myself, and Nancy are all music therapists. And if you sing out, you have a chance of really changing yourself. If you move, it's a better chance of that. And it might even lead to dancing. It's allowed. Would you stand up? I think Allison's going to play her violin. Catherine's going to play the piano. Liz and I are going to add percussion. We've got some dancers moving. We've got the choir coming in in a second. Let me get my drum. Are you ready? <laughs>
milestones to, uh, to uh, celebrate. Jenny, would you come up, please? It is my joy to be able to celebrate Jenny with you this morning. I have two tributes for her that I'm going to read. One comes from Marsha Stevenson, who can't be here today. She and her husband Jim are isolating because he has surgery, possibly, on Tuesday. So I'm going to read to Jannie what Marsha would like her to hear. It's always intrigued me to observe how some people who find their way to us by random chance end up as exemplars of our grounding principles. Jannie is one of those people, and it's been a joy to collaborate with her in the decades since she joined our staff. I could tell so many stories illustrating her creativity, organizational wizardry, consummate professionalism, and unfailing dedication to NSUC. But mindful of the time, let me sum up her gifts to us in eight sentences. First, each person Jannie interacts with is greeted warmly in recognition of their inherent worth. Whether the occasion evokes laughter or tears, Jannie responds always with compassion. I can vouch for that personally. You can always expect encouragement from Jannie, whether the lesson of the hour is about mindfulness, a craft project, tech training, or file management. As volunteers come in and volunteers go, we've learned to rely on Jannie to be the responsible one, helping us meet deadlines and legal requirements. Jannie follows her conscience in deciding when to speak up and when to keep her own counsel. As conflicts arise, count on Jannie's knack for diplomacy to help us find peace. The nexus of our interdependent community might just be Jannie's office. In <laughs> words and deeds, our church administrator models inclusion. Thanks for everything, Jenny. All right, we all, we all love and appreciate you so much. And I just want to add to that a brief, a brief comment because it's a joy for me to be here this morning to recognize the enormous contribution that Jannie's made to this community over 10 years. She's the voice on the phone that welcomes each call, the smile in the office that welcomes each person who comes through the door. Jannie is a pleasure to work beside and an organizer supreme. She's a treasure, and without her, I think, we would all be in a terrible muddle. <laughs> and Jannie's created programs for us, offered her art to us, and trusted us enough to share her life with us in a true Unitarian way. Thank you, Jannie. Thank you for sticking with us through thick and thin we know it can't have been easy, and we both respect and thank you and love you for it. Thank you. And now if Allison could come up and uh, bring
Brian Wellwood and Liz. <laughs> Allison, I can't believe it was 20 years ago when Barry chaired the committee to invite you to be a member and our, our music director here. And a, a number of us were there, I know, at that time, 20 long years. Thank you for being our music director for these 20 years. <laughs> so for 20 years so far of your conducting our choir with such love and patience and creativity and consistency for your own beautiful music and for your teaching, for organizing larger performances. We had one last year, last spring, Adi Amos here, and for, most, and, and for your faith in us mm -hmm. that we'd eventually pull the music together well enough. But even more, I thank you for your deep, passionate knowing about the aesthetic and transformative power of music that shines through you all the time and the way you are with us. And it calls forth the best in us all, where music is like a glue that connects us. And even when we have highly differing views and values, the music is there to draw us together. And that comes from you, Alice, and your vision and your passion of knowing that. And it helps us to be, to more often experience our Unitarian values, and thank you for that. Hi, Allison, here's, I usually don't have a piece of paper, but I, I need to do this time. Uh, some things that I appreciate about you and your 20 years of service. Some of these are repeats, of course, so it, your skill and patience in dealing with all of us choir members and members in the, in the congregation about their music and uh, from beginners to veterans, you uh, have a lot of patience with us. And your beautiful viola playing, it's, it's superb to have a top-notch professional musician to just jump in whenever you think it's, it's needed, and there are lots of occasions. Uh, it's just fantastic. Yeah. I notice your preparation every single season and every single week. Long before you start getting paid, you're already uh, determining what music we're going to play, buying it, sorting it, uh, making tracks for the choir, uh, and every week you, you uh, bring us to that point. Your willingness to pivot when needed. You've worked with so many different ministers, with so many different styles, some of whom have the whole year laid out and they don't change it, and others that change it every single week. And so you're needing to, to change what you do and what the choir does and what music you bring. And it's just amazing that you do that with such grace, without complaining, but I know it's a, it's a, big, it's a big task. Um, not just musically, but your insight and care for this congregation, not just the choir, but all of us. Uh, you watch how we're doing. You care about how we're doing. And, uh, and you help heal us when we need it. One thing over the last few years was your, I noticed, was your integrity and your willingness and ability to hold the space that needed to be held and to speak your truth. Uh, I know it was difficult. I know it, there are many times when you felt like you were on the spot and uh, you stood up and, uh, and challenged things that you didn't think were right. And I know it was not easy for you and I'm so 
so thankful you did it and so proud of you. Your enthusiasm and soulful spirit. Um, I don't know how you do it. Every single practice and every single week, you pump yourself up <laughs> to come here, no matter what's going on in your personal life. You come here and you give us your absolute best. And uh, I just really thank you for that. Um, and lastly, just your friendship to me and to many people in the congregation. You're a wonderful friend. Thank you. Just great. We're now moving on to uh, a portion of the service about connection and reconnection. The first service is always about seeing each other after the summer break. Uh, the first person who's going to talk is uh, Nancy McMaster, who was one of the founders of the music therapy program, Liz and my teacher, and Catherine Nicholson's teacher, and friend over the last 40, you know, five or so years. And um, Nance is going to talk about her life and uh, some changes, and then she's going to treat us to a little bit of Rameau, uh, which she played at Liz and my wedding. And uh, every time I see Nance, I try and get her to play the Rameau, and I'm just thrilled that uh, she's going to play the Rameau. Well, to my surprise, this might be emotional, but hey, that's, uh, that's connection. <laughs> so, um, I'm going to tell you a story that's one year old, exactly, exactly a year ago. And it, for me, it's about profound, deep connection with life, with myself, uh, with other people, with wisdom and with love. So, a year ago, almost exactly, as soon as I started retirement in my beloved new home, I felt a calm well-being and gratitude. I loved having nothing on my calendar. Uh, so five, five months of that, five months later, I entered five months of hell an almost intolerable physical pain that brought me to my knees, sobbing most days, with almost no medical support, but deep support from friends like Liz and Carrie, big time. And uh, then five months of that, two months ago, exactly, just as the effects of that disease were beginning to abate, I found out that there is metastasized cancer in my body. So it's been quite a year so far. Um, I was told that I had only a few more years to live this life as Nancy, and much to my gratitude, I instantly felt a profound sense of calm, and that has lasted. There's a whole story there about how, 
how I view death and how I view life. And, but I don't have that much time. But that calm was such a gift. Um, so after the five months of no, almost no medical care, I was instantly hospitalized. And with that calm and with such good care, I felt content and, and, and nurtured. And uh, yeah, getting that finally after needing that so badly five months earlier when I was in hell. In that context, my whole being relaxed. I felt safe. Um, um, I felt somehow I was ready that I felt more taken care of and loved than I had ever felt in my life. Now this was palliative care. They are famous for wanting to provide that to people and having a vocation really to provide that. Um, and and a miracle happened that feeling that well taken care of, I literally felt that seeping down into the earliest wounds I had about love. And, and that has lasted, even though I, I miss them. I wish I was still there. I, I'd happily live in that unit, but you know. <laughs> But then, but then my job is to, is to keep that and give that to myself. And um, when I was going through hell, it was very, it's very useful now to have that touchstone of I know what hell is. I've had some experiences in the last two months where I go, five months ago I would have said that was hell. And now I go, nope, that's not hell. We know it's got an end or... So that was useful, and also that I knew I had survived hell, that I was resourceful enough to do that, and that I know how I survived hell, which was moment by moment by moment, I gave myself the kind of attention and love that you would give a baby 24-7, and that hasn't stopped. So, two weeks in the palliative care unit, it was reparative. It has transformed who I am. And in that safety, my whole psyche opened up in extraordinary ways. I noticed every moment of what I saw, what I heard, what I felt, what I thought. Just there was nothing else to do, nothing else mattered. Just pay attention and be open. I had an equanimity. Um, I still remember lying on the bed feeling happy while they were doing some procedure that I hated. It's just, it's just like, what? This, this was not me <laughs> six months ago. <laughs> um, Yeah, so it's like nothing, nothing was disturbing me. Now I wasn't in horrible, I wasn't in hor horrible pain, and I didn't have nausea. And I am, I am currently trying to calm myself about chemo because I'm afraid of it. But I'm afraid of stories about it. I don't know what it would be like for me, and I've heard some great stories. So it sort of got to this phrase that I used to hate that people would say, "Nothing matters except love." And my personal biography with love, I thought that was nonsense. I didn't understand it. My experiences about love had been harmful from a really er early age and therefore dangerous. Not anymore. I'm so grateful. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So... I, I want to tell you that just around connection, my connection with life and myself and other people, but also I see profound parallels between what happened to me in a year and what's happened to this congregation. That we had a situation where we felt, you know, safe, safe enough, 
and open to be challenged and things were right. They were not perfect, they were right. And then we sort of went through hell. Many people went through hell. And I see now that where we are is this opportunity for our wisest selves to, to co-create an environment again where we feel loved and safe and um, open. So, so while I was in the palliative care, because it was a palliative care, they had a piano. Most palliative care piano places have piano. And so this piece I'm gonna play, uh, I would go play it almost every day. Thank you so much. Nancy said something to me that is going to stay with me for the rest of my life uh, in the midst of this process you went through. She said that she was going to bed every night with a smile on her face, waking up every morning with a smile on your face, and looking for the beauty in every moment, and just the most amazing way to live against that background. Um, we're going to move on to the offertory. Um, we've got a few more things. So Allison and the, the choir are going to come on up. The plate donation uh, is to the uh, Edible Food Project. Uh, the Edible Food Project have got an open house from 10 until 2 on the 16th of uh, September. I believe it's up at Lutet Farm. And uh, would the, uh, you two take the, you know. You will leave your cares at the door. Oh, 
moment for our sometime take some time for some meditation. It's part of our practice in our service. When we invite you to tune in groups, to calm the mind, to relax, to replenish, and to center for a few minutes. After all this work of transformation, as we've been talking about in the choir's been written in the choir's roots. Nancy and Carrie are going to provide some soft wash of sound on the gongs for you to focus your mind, if that works for you. And if it doesn't work for you, replace that with whatever you prefer today. So in a moment, I'm going to invite you to close your eyes and to find a comfortable position. Perhaps shift your position a little bit from where you've been sitting or how you've been sitting right now. And take a moment to be aware of the support of the chair underneath you and feeling your feet on the floor. sing 
Hallelujah, <laughs> the Leonard Cohen song. A man with clinical depression. And uh, as Marcus, our minister, once said, people with clinical depression tend to see things more realistically than optimists. And uh, this is his masterpiece. Are you ready, Polly? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
everybody. There's really only one announcement, and that is, if you can't smell it already, there's corn and there's burgers downstairs. And um, I think, unless anyone has anything to add, I think five bucks. And five even if you haven't signed up, apparently you can probably still eat. So we there's see. corn for all, I think. Okay. Well, I can't tell you how glad I am we got to the end of this. <laughs> <laughs> Is that my outside voice? Hallelujah! <laughs> 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 I believe it's the end. Uh, I hope that when you leave, you will have opportunities to connect and reconnect because it's so important. And I don't know if you can feel that zeitgeist here of this beautiful congregation. And now our closing song, Come, Come, Whoever You Are. I learned an interesting thing about Rumi. Uh, he's a Persian poet, but he's from greater Persia, and that's Turkey. <laughs> he's from Konya in Turkey, and one of those little areas of the world that's been moved around a lot over the years. So, are you ready? Would you want to stand up? And come, come, whoever you are, wanderer, worshiper, here we go. Come, come, whoever you are, wanderer, worshiper, lover of leaving us, is no caravan of despair. to travel on the road less traveled and I'm hoping to get your participation in that because I know every one of us here has made a choice at some point in their lives to go left or right and it sometimes is the right one and it's sometimes not that's what we're going to talk about next week this is the road less traveled in a this, way this yeah, yeah, no, no, no. thank you everybody Oh, we gotta blow these out.